I'm thrilled to introduce Luigi Zingales, the Robert McCormick Distinguished Service Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Luigi was the former president of the American Finance Association, and he currently directs the Center for Economic Analysis at the PCAOB. He's also co-developer of the Financial Trust Index, which measures the level of trust that Americans have towards their financial system, which may be introducing increased volatility uh, in the periods forward. His research spans very broadly, from corporate governance to the political economy, and he's published over 100 articles in leading economics and finance journals. His research regularly breaks ground into entirely new areas, and he's helped connect finance to culture, media, and what I think is potentially one of the most interesting papers, to testosterone and risk-taking. And in, in, in my view, makes Luigi what I think it to be fairly described as one of the most innovative and creative researchers in the field of finance. And I think beyond, and, and something I particularly admire about Luigi, is beyond his journal-based research, uh, which I believe I saw in bio, he's the 10th most cited person on SSRN. He's also connected with even a broader audience in two books, two trade books, which have been critically acclaimed. Uh, the first, Saving Capitalism from Capitalists, which he co-authored with Raju Rajan, offers a persuasive and I think often today overlooked exploration of the benefits offered by capitalism. And then I think in his most recent and really I think quite beautifully written book, A Capitalism for the People, Recapturing the Lost Genius of American Prosperity, uh, which was aptly described as brilliant uh, by The Telegraph, I think it's a book that all engaged citizens, and I wish all people running for political office, would benefit from reading in today's often, I think, confused and sometimes baffling discourse, political discourse around economics. So I think Luigi is someone that always brings a different perspective, is provocative uh, in his remarks, and so I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, we'll be sharing his remarks uh, tonight on auditors and fraud. So thank you, Luigi, for joining us this evening. So thank you very much, uh, Eugene, for such a nice introduction. I have to say that uh, who should give this speech, in fact, is Eugene himself. He has a, a, a really brilliant book coming out uh, in October about why people do commit uh, 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 white collar crime. And I strongly recommend you to, to read it. It's very, it's very well done and very interesting and entertaining. It's, it's hard to be both at the same time. Uh, one only objection to his introduction is that he's under the assumption that people running for office do read books, which I don't think is true anymore. So uh, before I speak, let me uh, be very clear. Uh, the other slight thing is I'm just the, the founding director. I'm a consultant for the PCOB, but of course uh, the views I will discuss today are my views and don't reflect uh, the views of the board, individual members, or staff of the PCOB. Uh, with this sort of uh, uh, very exciting preamble, I have also to tell you that uh, it's very hard to give a speech on fraud and give a speech of fraud at the same time as the opening of the Olympics. So I thank you very much for uh, finding the time uh, uh, to be here. So I want to tell you why I got interested in fraud. And uh, some of you probably have heard about uh, the Italian company Parmalat. And uh, in uh, end of 2003, Parmalat uh, was uh, basically the largest scandal ever. Now, of course, uh, it was beaten up by other scandals subsequently, but at the time, it was pretty amazing. And this is uh, um, also for the simplicity of the way it was done. Uh, number one, there was like $4 billion in a fake account in the Cayman Island. They were falsified by cutting and pasting the letterhead of Bank of America on a piece of paper and then faxed to the auditor who took it for granted and registered in the book. And uh, interestingly, uh, people, analysts, are not stupid. They ask, they said, wait a minute, why Pamela is borrowing so much money continuously in spite of the fact you have this $4 billion in the Cayman Island? And the answer was sophisticated tax arbitrage. And uh, this actually was my first lesson in, in, uh, in fraud, or how to detect fraud. All big fraud is covered up by a smaller one. 
Why? Because you and, and something sophisticated and you don't want to look too much into it. So, um, of course, the, the leading example is uh, Madoff, that uh, he let people sort of hint to the fact he was front running on uh, his brokerage accounts. And as an investor, do you really want to know that uh, the guy you give the money to is front running? No, because if you know, you are an accomplice and liable. And so it was a don't ask, don't tell. And that's the reason why so many people, smart people, did not ask questions. They did not want to ask questions. Um, the other actually happened uh, on, on my board position. At some point, there was a, a, a tax fraud uh, that was perpetrated by our sort of uh, uh, customers, not, not the company. But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, I don't skip the details, but they, this guy were mo uh, buying a huge amount of phone services and then reselling in a different place and trying to take advantage of the difference in the VAT. But the interesting thing is that uh, at some point, a third of the floor of this company, uh, of this subsidiary, was in this, involved in this business. And all the phone calls lasted exactly either 59 seconds or 123, a minute and, 29, and 23 seconds. So it's pretty hard that you have a third of revenues, we're talking about a, a, a billion euros, a third of that, actually, no, uh, the, the fraud was a billion, so three billion euros overall, a third of that was in this uh, flow of traffic, and why nobody asked the question, uh, is this normal? And the answer, I was told, why people did not go more deep into the stuff, is because uh, they were saying that this is premium traffic. And say, what is premium traffic? And the answer is porn. Okay, so they were sort of sharing this with the idea this was pornographic material. So if you are a board of a, in a, the company, you don't really want to know that you're making money with pornographic stuff. It is not kosher. So you don't want to look too much because if you know, you might be responsible. So you don't ask. And of course, behind this premium material there was a gigantic tax fraud. So I think it's very important, this about professional skepticism, that I learned studying the Parmalat case, uh, this. But just in case this was not, not enough, uh, the Parmalat had uh, a actual debt that was eight times the one reported. Okay, so it takes some Italian accountants to re reach this level of sort of sophistication. But you know, we, sometimes liabilities are understated but by a factor of eight. That's pretty amazing. In fact, uh, one of my favorite colleagues is Sam Peltman, a uh, famous uh, uh, economic professor. Um, and he's uh, a part-time sort of a um, value investor. And he told me, I remember the time, that he actually invested in Parmalat uh, close to the collapse, lost everything. But uh, he said, I figured that you underestimate liability by a factor of two, and overstate margin by a factor of three. Unfortunately, Parmalat was much, much bigger than that, and he lost all the money. But the other thing that was interesting is Parmalat had organized a system where the account of Cuba will settle all, all the sort of a, a mis uh, representation. So if you needed to generate more revenues, you will sell uh, some more milk to Cuba, fictitiously, so to settle all the accounts. So if you divided the number of liters of milk sold to Cuba by the population of Cuba, they all must have been like the Roman Empress Agrippina that was swimming in bath to preserve her sort of beautiful skin, because otherwise you couldn't make sense of it. But the most important thing, and by the way, uh, what I later learned is that uh, uh, the two uh, accountants of Grant Thornton were in it, in this scandal, but somebody, of course a woman, because in this respect it's true, all the whistleblowers tend to be women, uh, and all the criminals tend to be men, it's not a stereotype, unfortunately it's true, uh, in a woman inside sort of uh, uh, Grant Thornton reported that there were some irregularities to her boss, unfortunately her boss were in it, so did not go very far. But the thing that uh, shocked me is that at the time, I started reading the newspapers in Italy, and 
Of course, Expost, everybody uh, is very smart and said that, that if you went around Colecchio, the town where uh, Parmalat was headquartered, everybody knew about the fact that too much milk was sold in Cuba. Okay? This was a recurring joke among the employees uh, of the company. As the fact that there, was, there must have been the secretary who cut the letterhead of Bank of America, because I cannot imagine that Tansi, Calisto Tansi, the CEO, or Fausto Tano, the CFO, were there with the glue and the, and the scissor, cutting the letterhead and doing. So somebody must have done it. And gee, don't you wonder what that is? So the stuff that really shocked me at the time was, we have so many layers of monitors. We have uh, the board, in Italy, just in case, in addition to the board, you have the statutory board of auditors. Uh, and that now there is also a center to check the two of them, so there are three. Uh, then there are the internal auditors, the external auditors, uh, the credit rating agency, the SEC, the Italian SEC, the monitor of the banks, all of this. And there is a secretary who has all the valuable information, but no incentives to report. And so we have this very expensive system because you know that all these layers of monitoring are not done by sort of cheap people. Uh, they're done by expensive people because they want to recruit the best. So every layer is very expensive. And at the end, all these can be simply undone uh, by somebody cutting and pasting a letterhead. And uh, the better way to sort of undermine the system as was mentioned this morning is actually, if you cannot bring the, 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 the mountains to Mohammed, you better bring the Mohammed to the mountain. And so if you cannot bring the prosecutor, bring the people who have the authority to act to the facts, why don't you let the facts come to the people with the authority? And the simple way is to actually reward uh, uh, the whistleblowers. And, um, so this generated some research I've done that documents what uh, everybody was saying today is that most uh, crime, most corporate crime, is actually discovered by accident by third party. Very, uh, very little role. The SEC counts for 7%. The auditors, 10%, and most of them after SOX before uh, almost nothing. Private litigation that was mentioned earlier today, 3% of the cases. Um, while the employees count for 17, they're the biggest source, uh, short seller 15, uh, the media 13, and the media most of the time they get from the employees, and other regulators 13%. So uh, the question is why don't we make it easier to some extent to the employees uh, to report and to be rewarded? Because the secretary of uh, Calisto Tanzi was actually making significantly more than most secretary in the world and was treated well, and to this day, she swears by Calisto Tanzi. So uh, you cannot break easily that loyalty unless you bring money on the table. And, and this research that I conducted with some co-authors showed to me that you must be crazy to blow the whistle unless there is a whistleblower statue. Because uh, in some of the sample was actually composed of, today somebody said we should do research on, on what those uh, incentives provide. Some of the sample were, was uh, represented by healthcare companies where at the time the, flaw, the Fraud Claims Act was sufficient to give a reward to whistleblowers and has worked beautifully. And, and all ba basically most of the whistleblowers were from that sample because they got paid. The one who did it without being paid, their life got miserable. Actually, all the life of everybody got miserable, but as somebody said, if your life gets miserable but you have $20 million, uh, it's less miserable than if you're unemployed and, uh, and nothing else. And so, uh, in this spirit of saying, why don't we motivate the people with information to actually bring the information to the right place? My first question was, what about the auditors? And I remember going around and presenting the paper, and every place I presented, people said, oh, but it's not our responsibility to 
show fraud. So I went to the SEC and said, oh, it's not our responsibility to uncover fraud. I went in front of some uh, uh, accountants. It's not our responsibility. For, you go in front of the board. It's not our responsibility. So I said, that's the reason why there is so much fraud in the world, because it's nobody's responsibility to detect fraud, and uh, even less so to bring it to light. And the thing that really shocked me as a... Um, ignorant in the subject, because I have to say, I am not an accountant, and even if I'm trying to learn some, I know very little about it, um, in uh, the fact that uh, the auditors profess with a very strong faith that it's not absolutely their responsibility to detect fraud. And uh, uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, even reasonable explanation that fraud is by its nature is collusive, and so the essence of fraud is concealment, and and so on and so forth. Now, what shocked me is that if you don't listen to the auditors, but actually either you read their ancient books or you read their legal statutes, uh, you get a very different picture. So in uh, 1892 in England, the, vast, the widely used auditing textbook, A Practical Matter for Auditors by Lawrence uh, Dixie, say that uh, the objective of an audit was the detection of fraud. Technical errors and error of principle. Uh, the detection of fraud is the most important part, portion of what the auditor's duties are. Now, one of the questions is, what happened between 1892 and today that changed so dramatically the perception of auditors? Uh, before I give you that answer, let me actually read, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm sure I'm, I sort of uh, misinterpret things, but uh, I, I read sort of uh, uh, the SEC statute as amended by the 1995 uh, Private Security Litigation Reform Act. And um, it says that uh, if a registered public accounting firm detects or otherwise become aware of information indicating that an illegal act whether or not perceived to have material effects on the financial statement of the issuers, then has to do a lot of things, including first report to uh, the company, and if the company does nothing, report to the SEC. And so, how is it possible that the, on the one hand, the auditor says it's not our fault, on the other hand, the old auditor will say it's our duty, and even without going as far as the old auditors, the current legal statutes say, you have an obligation to do that. Now, clearly, uh, there is a difference between obligation of result and obligation of effort. So uh, I think it would be crazy, even I uh, would say that it's crazy to say that they have a duty to find out every possible fraud, because that's impossible. Um, and uh, one of the famous lines of economists is that if you never miss a plane, you waited too long at the airport and is a line I use all the time because I miss my fair share of planes. And so you're never sort of optimal in one extreme, so bringing fraud to zero would not be the optimal thing to do because the cost would be disproportionate. So I don't think that's a reasonable uh, uh, statue. Uh, and I don't think what the, the, what the statue is, but uh, I, I'm not qualified to comment on that. I can only qualify what I think is reasonable, and I don't think it would be reasonable to have that. What I think would be reasonable and what my reading of the statute is, is that if you observe something, or something that is worrisome, uh, does not need to be a fraud, but just a likely fraud, then you have a duty to report. And from a social point of view, it makes perfect sense. You are there on the place, and in fact, even with the employees, we could transform what is a whistleblower reward into a whistleblower obligation. Now, most of the time works better as a reward rather than obligation, but as, a, as an auditor, you have, you have an obligation not to look the other way around. And uh, now, one problem is, what is an illegal act? Because today, I pay attention, and most of the conference define illegal acts as financial fraud. And I have to tell you, and they're not in this moment top of my list in terms of fraud. I think corruption is much, much bigger. And 
it's pretty scary that in a day of conference about fraud, corruption was mentioned maybe one or twice. And uh, the response I have from auditors, oh, we're not trained to look at that. And I said, we are trained them, so it's our responsibility to change it. We cannot say they're not trained. They're not trained means that there, there is a, a problem. And, uh, and I want to give you sort of a, a, an example that is a true example. I will omit the company. But imagine you are sort of a, in a business that is prone to corruption. And uh, you see fee for intermediation. Now, this company, uh, most of the time, intermediation are illegal. But under some situation, you can pay an intermediation fee because there are some legitimate intermediation. And you see this item, 0, 0, 0, 200 million, 0, 0, 0. <laughs> so if you are an auditor, question in your auditing exam, if you are an auditor, would you ask question or not? Now, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an auditor. My interpretation of the SEC statute say you should. And in this particular case, I know that if you did, you figure out that this 200 million were paid to a company that uh, did not even have a website. So uh, there was no really clear correspondence for what you pay for. So this was a gigantic red flag of, of fraud. Uh, the auditor did not ask. Why did not ask? Because a lot of auditors think it's not their responsibility. Why do you want to get into trouble? Uh, after all, and I love the line of uh, who said today, uh, everything is recorded. After all, it was recorded, and they didn't have, was not saying fraud, bribe, pay to X. Uh, it was just called intermediation fee, which is tantamount as the same thing most of the time, especially in certain businesses. Uh, but uh, you had plausible deniability. And how many auditors have been charged for ignoring that line? Not very many. Uh, they get away with much less. And uh, in this particular case, so far, they got away. And I suspect they will until the end. So I think that what happened is regulation came in and mandated auditing. So if your demand is assured, you can do whatever you want. And then what we're trying to do is minimize cost. How do you minimize cost? You minimize liability. So since 1892 onward, the accounting profession, the auditing profession, has tried to convince everybody else around the world that what they thought, that auditors were actually there to try to minimize fraud, was completely false, and they had no responsibility. And the few people who had the courage to actually say the right things got in trouble. So at some point, the former chairman of PwC, Dennis Nelly, in, a, in 2007 Wall Street Journal article, admits that the audit profession has always had the responsibility for the detection of fraud. Now, that very sentence now is used in the colonial case against PwC. Now, he's out of the picture, so still, his, sort of his colleagues are now paying for his honesty. So it does pay for the uh, sort of uh, uh, profession to deny that they have anything to do with fraud, and there is not their responsibility, and that uh, if you look the other way, is great. And now, you would like to think that reputation actually works. Um, in economics, we always have this fantastic view of reputation. Since uh, Pharma 1980 article, there is this idea of exposed settling up, that the labor market will punish you for your misdeed. Now, I'm not so sure that actually this is the case. So, um, uh, Yale School of Management had a fantastic case on Lehman Brothers and EY sort of uh, dealing of uh, the infamous uh, Repo 105. And uh, you can read in Valuka's report, and the Valuka's report says that uh, EY did not inform the audit committee, remember section 10B5? Uh, EY did not inform the audit committee or the full board 
of a whistleblower, at least allegation, regarding Repo 105. Now, Repo 105 had been going on for at least six years at a time, and uh, the auditor claims that uh, he was not part of the deal when they were created, but in 2008, uh, actually, he's confronted with a whistleblower that tells him, look, we have a problem that has Reba 105. He does not report this to the audit committee or to the board, nor follow up with the SEC. Now, is he punished in any way? No, he's head of the global banking practice of the company. So I think his uh, crime does pay. And uh, there is no punishment for auditors who look the other way. And uh, I don't know that th this is for sure an AY case because there will be a judgment, but what Valuka suggests and what the evidence suggests is clearly in that case. So what can we do to sort of uh, change the situation? Because I don't like just to complain. I like to sort of uh, uh, try to find solution. So the first one has actually been implemented by the PCOB after a long struggle by Chairman Dotti, which is the disclosure of uh, engagement partners. So I just read a paper where in China, auditors that don't perform well are penalized in the labor market. You know why? Because actually you know who they are. They are disclosed. And for many, many years, the profession in the United States fought aggressively against disclosure with, in my view, uh, sort of uh, very sort of uh, uh, non-convincing reasons. And I think the, the actual reason is that uh, once you know who they are, uh, it's much easier to sort of penalize them. After all, do you want to get brain surgery from the guy who just uh, had five deaths in his sort of uh, surgery? And all the stories that I kind of say that there is randomness, sometimes people are wrongly penalized. You know what? Happens to doctors, happens to lawyers, happens to every profession. Uh, there is an intrinsic randomness. You don't want to over-penalize people. But do you want to know if you are sort of a, a surgeon has uh, had a lot of failure in his surgery before it operates you? Absolutely. I don't know why, as an investor, you should not have the same right vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, who check uh, your money, basically, because that's what investors' money. The second thing, which is very important, especially in this audience, is uh, a serious training of auditors. So I thought that uh, I was very lucky in uh, being interested in the Pamela case, and then I was also an expert witness in a, in a legal case regarding Parmalat before I became a board member because it's a very humbling experience. The board of Parmalat, pretty much like the board of Enron, had phenomenal people in it. One of the top Italian lawyers was on that board. How could you possibly have missed it? And I think that enough of those stories scare the hell out of you in understanding that you have to be careful, and what are the issues that they, 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 they work and uh, in concealing fraud and so on and so forth. And um, we are doing a little bit of that inside the PCOB. We actually, uh, the, the Center of Economic Analysis has started a program that you are not going to hear because we cannot publicize the result, but an internal program in which we do a little bit like the FAA. After every crash, the FAA try to figure out why the damn plane crashed, and uh, try to, to do what, what, uh, what did we do wrong, and uh, is there any rule could have done differently that uh, we can sort of uh, fix it? And on a very small scale, but we're trying to do exactly that. What are the major scandals after uh, the creation of the PCOB, and uh, what are the typical accounting tricks that I use to create those scandals, why the auditor missed those scandals, and in those cases in which the, we inspected those companies, how did the PCOB miss that particular area of inspection, or maybe uh, look at that area and miss the fraud. I think that uh, uh, the best way to train your uh, inspector is to show 
what have been done, what we've done wrong in the past. And unfortunately, because this stuff is done with confidential uh, information uh, from the PCOB, we cannot release it to the large public. Um, maybe in the future we'll do a sort of a, a clean version with public information. But I strongly encourage, uh, especially places like Notre Dame, that train an enormous amount of uh, 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 auditors, to actually use cases like that in training. And please don't use them in the ethic classes. Because once you use them in an the ethic class, you understand that there is something you have to do in church and something you have to do everywhere else. Okay? And I grew up in Italy where there was a mandatory hour of religion in high school. And that mandatory hour of religion made more atheists than Karl Marx. <laughs> and uh, so I think that uh, separate classes of ethics not only don't help, they are counterproductive because they allow you to be unethical outside of that realm. I think that this issue should be taught in the classes that are of the subject. So in accounting, in finance, in economics, some issues can be brought up and sometimes we might not have the solution because after all we're not ethicists, but just raising the problem is extremely important because uh, Grace Jonas said something very important today is most of the big scandals did not happen because people did not see the problem did not happen because the auditors did not see the problem, is because the auditors saw the problem and somehow rationalized it away. So asking the right question is much more important than being a, a great investigator and uncovering the, sort of the secret, uh, the secret code. And in that respect, I think that that's extremely important in sort of uh, 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 training the future auditors. Uh, the, 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 another thing is I am very um, uh, glad that the whistleblower statute was extended also to corporate fraud. So initially it was only in the Flaws Claim, Claim Act was for fraud against the public administration, then it was brought to the IRS, and it was only after Dodd-Frank that was uh, included also for corporate fraud even if is in a much milder version than the False Claim Act. So uh, there is a filter not done by a uh, plaintiff lawyer, but done by the SEC, which uh, uh, we heard today uh, at least pays somebody, but is not as aggressive as in the other cases. But still, this is a, a fantastic uh, uh, in, uh, uh, novelty that hopefully will help tremendously in that direction. Um, but I think more can be done inside the auditing firms. So uh, we know, and we learn also today in a fantastic talk by Chris, that people uh, very often are willing to share problems if interviewed individually. And uh, most of the time, uh, these are overruled by who is above. So, uh, we know that uh, there is a uh, engagement pattern review that has been strengthened by the PCOB a few years ago. And one potential idea is to say, why don't we have an internal channel within the firm in which employees of uh, engagement A can send direct and confidential messages to the reviewer uh, of that engagement, not the engagement partner, but the reviewer, uh, so that when uh, the reviewer goes and asks questions to his partner, he comes with an interesting set of information that is sort of uh, relevant to the case, so can ask the right set of questions. Because again, what I'm frustrated by is that current system of controls are very, very expensive. And so I'm very reluctant of putting more and more system of control. I just want those system of control to work. And uh, last but not least, I think uh, there is a need to change uh, the understanding of uh, the responsibility of auditors and the liability. So I don't think that uh, auditors should be accountable to be 
uh, police inspectors, but I think that precisely because every big fraud is covered up by a small fraud, it is important for auditors to be aware, be sensitive, and react even to the small fraud that might be uh, non-materially relevant, but might cover something else. It is like the famous cockroach theory that once you see a cockroach, you know there are many more coming, and so you better do something about it. Uh, the same is true with fraud. When you see a small fraud, most of the time there is something bigger lurking in the back. And uh, I think should be uh, a responsibility, and my reading, but again, I'm not a lawyer, my reading of the statute is this responsibility exists today, is just not aggressively enforced and not aggressively perceived by the profession. And why do I think that this is so important? Because I think that the cost of fraud is extremely large. And not only the average cost that I sort of study with other colleagues and estimated, et cetera, but every major financial crisis in the history of the United States start with a major financial fraud. And that major financial fraud basically undermined the confidence of the system. And that has dramatic effect. So think about at the bottom of the 2008 financial crisis is not leverage, is not sort of a, the repeal of Glass-Steagall, is not greed, is old-fashioned fraud. There were a lot of mortgages that were fraudulent, and once there are a lot of fraudulent mortgages and you don't know where they are, of course the system freezes. Okay, so think about what is the cost of the financial crisis on the U.S. economy. The Federal Reserve of Dallas estimated that the cost, the total cost of the financial crisis as lost income at the time and also the, the economy is on a lower path of growth is between six and 12 trillion dollars. So we're talking about between 50,000 and 120,000 per citizen. This is gigantic. So this is the reason why, in my view, this profession exists, and that's the reason why this profession is so important. Because the costs of failure are enormous, and so we need to fix the plumbing to avoid the cost of failure. And that's the reason why the auditor's job is so important, and that's the reason why your job, both in research and in teaching, is crucial to the success of the U.S. economy. Thank you. So um, there, are, there is a time for a few questions, because I think the Olympic segment has already finished, so uh, you're not missing much. Um, but um, with a caveat that uh, don't ask me too tough accounting questions because I don't know how to answer them. Yes. Easy question. So given that this room is the academic and educational community, I think from the, what I heard from your speech is that forensic accounting and the education and class of forensic skill sets are deeply required for an accounting degree or an accounting profession. Would you be in support of that type of training, whether it's a class or what have you? Oh, absolutely. In fact, if you remember, I asked you a specific question whether you inside your own firm use those skills on the other side of the fence. Yes, you and, did. And, and I was very pleased that the answer was that at least in the big companies, you do, which in a sense is the right answer because I'm the first one to recognize, I'm an economist after all, so I first of all recognize there are costs and benefits. And because, uh, with all due respect for Chuck E. Cheese, but a financial fraud of Chuck E. Cheese is not going to destroy the U.S. economy. So um, even if uh, they don't report perfectly, it uh, might be still a crime, but from an economic point of view, it's not such a major disaster. If you are a large institution, whether financial or financial, this has gigantic repercussions. And so using those skills uh, is crucial. And um, I think that... Uh, what I found it extremely valuable today's set of presentation 
is that was training, at least me, I am sort of a, a nerdy economist who know very little about this stuff, uh, in, in some skills that I wish I had more in my life. And it says, how to ask questions to a board in a non-confrontational way. Uh, I always asked them in the wrong way because I knew I was right. And, uh, and you know what? Most of the time I was right, it didn't matter. That, that's the sad part. It didn't matter because I sort of alienated enough people that by the end, even if I was right, it didn't reach the right conclusion. So I think that uh, all this set of skills that famous professional skepticists, uh, but even a bunch of psychology recognize the typical trait of a psychopath. I think psychopaths don't come in that many forms, and uh, most of us, thank God, don't encounter them in, their, in our lives, at least especially early on, so we don't know how to recognize them on the spot. But gee, isn't that important in any business situation? If you even have a small hint, uh, and uh, I love the classics, and I think it's good time to spend the classic, but trying to sort of read Shakespeare to learn uh, human nature is useful, but it's not as useful as doing a bit of psychology to learn how to recognize a psychopath. I think that we should definitely do that training uh, more extensively. Uh, Luigi, I, I agree with you that um, it's important that we have reliability of financial statements to avoid market for lemon type situations. But do you really think that the 2008 crisis was the fault of auditors? It's not loan origination problems? Um, of course, uh, it sort of uh, is overdetermined uh, because it takes a village to commit a crime. And I don't know whether you have seen the, the movie Spotlight, uh, but I strongly recommend to uh, everybody to see the movie. And one of the greatest lines of the movie is said, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to rape one. Okay, it's a very dramatic statement. Of course, they were talking about pedophilia case in the Catholic Church, but the movie is about it takes a village to rape one. There is a lot of people co-responsible. Uh, what I am saying is that if the auditor had pointed out that you couldn't make some securitization because uh, the information was false, uh, certainly the crisis would have been smaller, but probably would have stopped much earlier, even there, there was no crisis. Now, are they guilty in the, whatever, Catholic sense? I don't know. I let my priest tell you that. But uh, from an economic point of view, you don't look at guilt in the sense of uh, uh, religious sense. You look at uh, if they had behaved differently, would the outcome be different? In that case, I said yes. So I, I just want to pick up on, on that point. I think the answer is uncategorically yes. If, if you had approached the audit from a perspective of how do you make a triple B security into a triple A because you went through some mathematical model and you looked at it from a business point of view, no auditor would have been able to sign off on those financial statements. And it goes back to the question of, are you complying with a set of rules, or are you looking at it in terms of the economics of the presentations? If we had stopped that at that stage in the profession, I agree with Luigi, a lot of things would have not been able to be done. And, and this is not a finance guy trying to dump it on the accountants, OK? Uh, this is, we have our responsibilities. We all are, that's what I'm saying. It takes a village. However, I really like uh, uh, your, your position because I think all too often we look on a very narrow form and say we're doing our duty by not looking at the impact on the system. And, and I think that uh, if we spend a little bit more time thinking the bigger picture, because what I learned is there are good accounting principles that say we want a fair representation. And is this a sort of a, a, a fair representation to investors? I think that's the ultimate question you want to ask, not whether you qualify under rule X or rule Y. And I think that uh, we have lost a lot of that. I think most people, uh, I don't remember who said today, but about the loopholes, uh, yes, I think it was you. Uh, I think that uh, uh, 
lawyers are trained in loopholes. I think that uh, most smart people tend to make a living by outsmart rules. And uh, I think that we should be aware of that and trying to put uh, a stop of that because that's very costly to society. It's costly in terms of, of a lot of wasted talent, uh, but also it's, a lot of, uh, it's costly for the consequences as we've seen with the financial crisis. Um, so I have a question. This may be a, a, a function of my faulty training, but wh why do you think, given that the cost is so huge and the impact is so large, that all market discipline fails to, to sort of capture sort of the banks and the equity markets and the bank markets and the analysts? And why are we so bad? Why does all that fail? I mean, clearly we seem to be coming to the answer as regulation, but. Taking a step back, I'm curious your, your, why you think in this setting with, the, with these trillions of dollars at stake, we all fail to sort of correct it? Because most of the time, we don't pay individually uh, the price. Because we, again, I say, I follow the rules in my little box. And uh, even if I know them well, that what I'm doing is creating problems X and Y, but because I am protected by a rule, I feel entitled to do it. And you know what? When I sort of uh, eventually uh, go into uh, some sort of trouble, that rule will protect me. And the question that we don't ask enough, I try to, to answer it. And I today at, at dinner, I realized I missed by a factor of at least two and a half, because how much fraud gets undetected? It says my estimate said that sort of uh, three out of four fraud gets undetected. Uh, today at dinner, I got uh, from somebody who actually advise uh, people who uh, are in trouble, so he knows much more than I do, nine out of 10 goes undetected. So um, I think that uh, crime does pay. And, uh, and I think that until crime does pay, people continue doing it. Um, and I think that uh, that's what uh, we need to figure out how to uh, minimize that. Can we actually tell that nine out of ten crimes actually pay off? Because you know, if you keep keep repeating crime, right? At some at some stage, you get you know people will know that you are actually involving in crime. So can we actually tell that nine out of ten crimes, you know, pay off? I don't know. Uh, actually, you you raise a question I've been wondering for a long time. Because uh, since I got interested in sort of uh, corporate crime and et cetera, I said, OK, there must be a potential way out. And it says, I understand uh, the pressure. I understand all the stuff. But generally, people at the top of a large organization are not completely crazy. Uh, and uh, so even if my overestimate their odds, uh, they must have a way out. And so I, I wondered for a long time what was the way out. And today, actually, I got a confirmation uh, because my theory has always been that uh, if you, for example, inflate earnings and you keep doing it in an escalating way, uh, you should understand that at some point there is a limit. Uh, and uh, how do you get out? And the answer are mergers. Uh, it, it, you can be... Uh, I was thinking about being a seller in a merger, and uh, once the buyer finds out, uh, he doesn't want to admit because it looks stupid, and so he's going to eat the loss and move on. And so your secret is, first of all, to be bought out. Uh, the other is to buy other companies, and, uh, and that you can more easily sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, fuzz uh, the accounts. Now, the problem is, then now there is a competition because if both buyers and sellers are frauds that they try to cover, uh, it's not easy for a buyer to cover the fraud if the seller is also a fraudster. So at some point, there is a limit to what the game is played. But actually, we know from the accounting literature, I think that uh, Paul Healy has an old paper about this, I remember him presenting many, many years ago, about the poor performance of mergers exposed. Mm -hmm. And this might be the, the reason uh, because you merge only when you have to, not only, but one of the big reasons of mergers is to want to sort of cover up stuff, and, and you get away with that. 
th there was a, an interesting article in the uh, Wall Street Journal in the last week uh, dealing with the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers being sued. Uh, I think it was Columbia Bank. Mm -hmm. and colonial. The, colonial, is a colonial, thank you. And um, they were, they're being sued for not recognizing that um, I sounded like a mortgage broker who owed, who, who uh, the bank had a big receivable from, that that receivable was essentially going to be uncollectible because the, the mortgage was, the broker was largely fraudulent. Uh, and Deloitte had been the auditor of the, uh, the mortgage broker. Price Waterhouse was being sued by um, basically representative of the mortgage broker uh, for not recognizing um, in their audit that this, that, that it was being argued that they should have recognized uh, the other fraud for, for a non-audit client in, a, in any event. It's, that's, that's truly an extension of the village, I would think, if it re we reach the point where auditors can be uh, maybe held responsible for identifying frauds for a company that they're not actually the auditor of. Um, so I, I don't know the details of the case, but I think that what is, I understand your concern and are completely legitimate. However, there is a risk of over-reliance on somebody else. In a sense, the, the Parmalat case, I don't remember who was the main auditor, probably was Deloitte, uh, but they were relying on Grant Thornton to do sort of uh, that particular part. And, uh, and so, of and Grant Thornton immediately de-recognized de the local branches of Grant Thornton that all of a sudden did not, did not become Grant Thornton anymore. So uh, first you say that why do you go to a big accounting firm is because of reputation. But when the moment sort of uh, they get, do something wrong, they are sort of immediately expelled from the network and the network does not really pay the reputation. So I think that it's very dangerous to get things in the, in the crack. And, and I'm saying, uh, particularly in the mortgage thing, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that uh, if there are people with uh, four or five mortgages with the same address, they cannot be all home mortgages. So this is the level of uh, competence that would have reduced or eliminated the financial crisis. And that level of diligence was not followed. And I think that that is what I consider a problem. I'm sympathetic to your argument that uh, audit firms take on more responsibility for detecting fraud. I'm curious to, as to how you think we get from where we are today to where that would lead us in the sense that I don't see uh, businesses wanting that. I don't see audit firms wanting that. So the only way I can see is for there to be regulation or the PCA or B to take more of a role in that. Where do you come out in terms of how we get to where you want to go on this? Um, there is a reason why I'm an economist and not a politician, because I don't know how to go from Y to X. Uh, I just point the right direction, and then I tell people, uh, no, I, this, this is jokes aside, but there is a truth in every joke. Um, I, I don't know. I, you're, you're raising a, a very good point. Um, I think that uh, our role as academics is not to strategize on this, but to make very uh, visible these problems. I think that, for example, the narrative that uh, a failure of audit was at the root of the financial crisis is not a prevailing narrative. And, uh, and I think that's crucial, because if this was a prevailing narrative, demand will follow. Uh, again, uh, somebody raised today say why uh, there is a demand for uh, corporate crime conviction? And the answer that was given was absolutely right, is because if you lost a lot of money, you want somebody hanged in the public square. And whether this is right or wrong, whether it's the right feeling, I leave uh, somebody else to judge, but the political demand comes. And uh, of course, if they don't know that uh, there is even a responsible, uh, then the demand is not there. But if there was a clear identification, I think the demand will be there. And um, I think it was Barney Frank, Frank that said, uh, when our constituency pressure very strongly, there is no lobbyist, no sort of uh, vested interest, nothing that resists. The problem is 99.9% .9 of the time, the constituency is asleep. 
And uh, when they continue to sleep, of course, they do something else. So I think our role is to wake them up. I think this is a good moment to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'll just thank, thank Luigi for, for contributing. And I, I think what, what he raises is, is I think about his comments. And I, and I would encourage everyone to read his AFA address uh, in the Journal of Finance last year, which I think echoes some of these comments. It's, I think it's really a call to make us all think and deeply question, both as an accounting profession, but also as, as teachers, as professors, about our, our role in the classroom, about not just focusing on the, the technical things that I think we all feel very confident as academics doing, but, but even more broadly about the role of bringing in ethics and, and other, other roles, the things that make us uncomfortable, that make other people uncomfortable, and what role we, we should also be doing here. And I think his call, which I think he's making in a broad way, particularly finance and economics, accounting, very broadly, is something uh, we can all think more about. So thank you, Luigi, and uh, I'll enjoy uh, the evening tonight, everyone.